here for the first presentation and in the first presentation uh, we dealt with William Miller um, part of what I was trying to identify in the first presentation is the way that William Miller has been typified um, his death was typified by Moses death his calling by Elisha his his work and his spirit by Elijah and John the Baptist and also pointed out that he typifies God's people here at the end of the world. Um, those that give the third angel's message will be operating upon the same rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by uh, William Miller. Um, we pointed out that it was the angel Gabriel that directed his understanding of the prophecies and that one of the things that the angel Gabriel gave to William Miller was the commencement of the chain of truth that he was coming to understand and the chain of truth that he was coming to understand is the time prophecies that's what he was led to it wasn't to doctrine he wasn't Martin Luther understanding righteousness by faith or justification by faith he was led to the time prophecies and sister white told us that the angel Gabriel I'm putting things together there gave him the commencement of those chains of truth and he identified that the commencements he was given were the, 20, the commencement of the 25, 20, the 13, 35, and the 2300 days, which puts an endorsement upon his understanding of the daily and upon the 25, 20. Um, we touched a little bit on the fact that um, where he began to lose his way is that he was, he got to the point where he began listening to those men that were closely associated with him. That was his first mistake. And I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here on this board here, but I do want to point something out before we begin. We're going to we're going to deal with the principle that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. How does this work? Pull it apart. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and there is a difference um, that I want to point out that we're familiar with, but I want to remind us of it. If that's the Millerite history, and this is our history. Yeah, October 22nd, 1844, that concludes their history, and there are certain parts of their history that took place afterwards, all right? In their history, there was two temple cleansings. We're going to deal with that more tomorrow. We're going to deal with that specifically. I'm not going to defend it now, but... When Christ cleansed the temple, when he was here on earth, the way he cleansed the temple was divinity flashed through humanity. Uh, this happened twice in the Millerite history. On August 11th, 1840, the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down out of heaven. Divinity flashed through humanity. Sister White tells us that angel is no less a personage than Jesus Christ. This began the first temple cleansing. By June of 1842, the Protestants of the United States had closed their door. And the first temple cleansing of that history had been fulfilled. Then in the summer of 1844, Exeter camp meeting, August 12th through 17th, 1844, the midnight cry is accomplished. Divinity flashes through humanity for a second time. The second temple cleansing takes place on October 22nd, 1844. The second door in that history is closed. There was two temple cleansings in that history. The temple is cleansed by divinity flashing through humanity. The first temple cleansing cleansed the Protestant churches outside of the Millerite movement. The second temple cleansing that was accomplished by divinity, divinity flashing through humanity at the midnight cry cleansed the Millerites. In our history, there's a reversal. For us, judgment begins where? At the house of God. So on September 11, 2001, when this mighty angel comes down, the first temple cleansing begins in Adventism. It goes 9-11. It goes until the first door in this history is closed, and that's the Sunday law. I'm going to do it here to parallel this. That's the Sunday law in the USA which parallels the activity of the Protestants of the USA in this time period. At that point, the latter rain is poured out without measure. Divinity flashes through humanity for a second time in this history. And this temple cleansing continues until Michael stands up, Daniel 12, 1. 
So there's two temple cleansings in this history. They both begin when the mighty angel comes down. Divinity flashes through human humanity. In this history, the test goes till June of 1842. The Protestants close their door. First temple cleansing completed. Then the midnight cry. Divinity flashes through humanity. The door closes October 22nd, 1844. Second temple cleansing. But it's reversed in our history. In our history, the first temple cleansing takes place within God's people, within, the, within Adventism. Judgment begins at the house of God. So on September 11, 2001, the latter rain begins to sprinkle. Judgment of the living begins. The first temple cleansing is underway. It concludes at the Sunday law in the United States, activity of the Protestants in the United States. At that point, the wheat and tares of Adventism are separated, and then the Lord pours out his Holy Spirit upon the wheat without measure. Second manifestation of divine power. Second temple cleansing. The reason, we're going to deal with that more. It's good to run it by you one time if you haven't thought it through before in advance. But what I want you to see here is a reversal of, of history. And the reason I want you to see that is because we're going we're to start here with a controversy that takes place immediately after October 22nd, 1844. It's called the shut door. There's a shut door controversy that takes place on this side of this history. But the shut door controversy will be repeated in our history, but it gets repeated before our door closes. It gets repeated in this history here. For them, it was after the door closed, but this history has a reversal. Okay, so in... On page 13 of your notes, and I'm not going to read all this, this rather long passage is from Gerhard Damsteed's book on Millerite history called The Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission, page 110 to 114, where he's dealing with the shut door controversy that came into the Millerite history immediately after October 22, 1844. All right, they... The Millerites had been preaching that on October 22nd, 1844, the door of mercy was closed forever. The Lord was going to return. There's no more probation. Y if you're not on, on board with this message, you're lost. So on October 22nd, 1844, when the Lord doesn't return and they splinter into various factions, they begin developing different concepts about what the shut door represents because... They fully understood that they were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins. And part of the parable of the ten virgins is the shut door. And then they believed that to their very core. William Miller understood that he was presenting the, the parable of the ten virgins way before 1840. He understood what the work he was doing in the context of the parable of the ten virgins. So he had an understanding of the shut door throughout his presentations. And he maintained that understanding of the parable of the ten virgins, which he had from the beginning. And this is, this is where I'm not going to get into detail, but I'm at least going to point you in this direction. It's important to understand this. William Miller, back here in the beginning, he had understanding of the parable of the ten virgins. But at the seventh month movement in 1844, after the first disappointment in the seventh month movement, when the light of October 22nd, 1844 comes to the surface. Suddenly they have a clear view of the parable of the ten virgins and they move away from William Miller's understanding of the parable of the ten virgins and they accept an understanding of the parable of the ten virgins that deals with the experience from 1843 to 1844. All right, and so as we, we have some quotes in here and I don't know that we're gonna read them all, but it's in this time period after the, the disappointment that one of the things that, William, that it's noted about William Miller is he reverts back to his old understanding of the parable of the ten virgins. So this is, a, this is something that went on with him, but it's something to understand about this history. When they get to October 22, 1844, they're suddenly splintered, scattered, and the controversy that's confronting them has to do with this shut door. So... If you have opportunity to read this, if you don't have Damsteed's book, do it. I'm going to point you to just some parts of it to try to bring this into focus now for our consider consideration. He's, refer he's using for his reference, Damsteed, the day star. You can see that in the very first sentence 
Um, and if you flip over to the second page of our notes for this study, page 14, at the bottom of the first big paragraph, speaking of this publication, the Day Star, the last sentence, she says, in 1846, the Day Star published the first vision of E.G. Harmon's. So he's using, Damstead's using the historical record primarily from the Day Star as he's going to describe for us this shut door controversy. Now notice after he says that, it seems that immediately after the disappointment, she held for a short time in common with the Advent body that the door of mercy was then forever closed to the world. However, before she received her verse, before she received her verse first vision in December 1844, she had given up the mid, my, midnight cry and shut door as being in the past. It was through this vision that she became convinced of the validity of the seventh month movement and that there was a shut door on October 22nd, 1844. So there was some confusion about the shut door on, from October 22nd, 1844. And a lot of different ideas popped up. And Sister White, being a Millerite, she was in the same mindset as everyone else. But when she receives her vision, two months later, October, November, two months later, December 1844, that vision, that first vision, gives her the light where she's, she understands the shut door from that point on. Now, if you go over to um, the next page, the second paragraph, it says, at the Lowhampton Conference of Adventists, Himes urged three aspects of future missionary activity. And who is Himes? Himes is the man that connects with William Miller in 1840 and provides the ways and means of finally promoting William Miller's message. And, and, and this was a divine um, connection. Himes was supposed to be there. He's the one that catapulted the message during that time period. Ultimately, he's the one that, the primary one that prevents William Miller for, from accepting the third angel's message. And so they're having a, a, a meeting after October 22nd. And uh, they're discussing what they're going to do about missionary work now that they're they're unsure about what the shut door means and um, dropping down the next paragraph two paragraphs down where it says at the end of the april at the end of april 1845 in Alb albany new york a conference of adventists was called together by ham himes with the object of ending the confusion and division so by this time in 1845 you're going to see what Miller says about it, I believe. Yeah, Miller's going to comment on the circumstances that it exist among these people that had formerly been totally united, all right? A, a year later, after October 22nd, 1844, they're anything but united, and they're bringing together this conference to try to solve the problem, together by Himes with the object of ending the confusion and division. Miller commented, it need not be replied that it was convened to deliberate respecting and if possible to extricate ourselves from the anarchy and confusion of Babylon. Miller's saying we're in Babylon. There's so much confusion now that we need to figure out how to get out of Babylon in which we had so unexpectedly found ourselves. At the Albany Conference chaired by Miller, it was decided to reject all new theological interpretations which had been develop, developed since the disappointment. Now, the history of William Miller here, and, and I'm trying to point out his history because he is a type of Seventh-day Adventists that received the mark of the beast. Okay. The first mistake of William Miller that's documented by history was his dependence on Himes or, uh, and other men. Himes is the classic example. And as you read through that, that dream of William Miller, you'll see that that's how um, Elder Arnold understood it too. Um, his first problem was trusting in men. But the second problem is at this Albany conference, they determined that any new light that had come after October 22nd, 1844 was, to, was not to be accepted. And the light that had been established immediately after October 22nd, 1844 was the light of Ellen White's first vision. Okay, that's the, the immediate light. So they're going to reject that light. And what was the light of Ellen White's first vision? She saw the Advent people on a path, and there was a bright light set up behind them 
that cast light all along the path. And what was that bright light behind them? The midnight cry. So in this conference here, what Miller and these men are about to do is they're about to reject the midnight cry. See, Miller's first step, wrong step, was trusting in men. His second wrong step was rejecting the midnight cry. And this put him in a position where he rejects the third angel's message in the Sabbath. Okay. And for Adventists at the end of the world, our first mistake is trusting men. Okay, it's the first mistake. <laughs> Doesn't matter who it is. <laughs> You're not even supposed to trust yourself. Okay? You're supposed to trust the word of God alone, period. <laughs> We will reach a point at the end of the world if we have conditioned ourselves, trained ourselves, made habits of trusting in men, that when the issue of the latter rain arrives, and the latter rain has been typified by the midnight cry. Sister White compares the latter rain with the midnight cry. When the message of the latter rain arrives, if we are among those that Miller is typifying, that have placed our trust in men, we will find ourselves rejecting the latter rain message, rejecting the midnight cry, as Miller did, and the next step will be to receive the mark of the beast. Miller is typifying this. Um, so, in which we had so unexpectedly found ourselves, at the Albany Conference, chaired by Miller, it was decided to reject all new theological interpretations which had be de been developed since the disappointment. Everyone know what a buttery is? <laughs> not you, and <laughs> not you. Anyone else know what a buttery is? A buttery is the room in the house where all the food that is going to be eaten right away is stored. It's a place to store food in the house. Where, and if you read William Miller's Dream, you'll understand this because that's where I understood it from. I don't have any insight on these archaic words. But in the olden days, the days of William Miller, a buttery was a, a room in the house, not where, you store, not where you stored your canned goods for months and months. It's where you put your food that you were going to eat. A pantry, okay, that you're going to eat immediately. And William Miller, in that dream, when he's in this history here, he, he passes through the point where the James White and the Joseph Bates and the Ellen Harmon are offering him some of this good food, this present truth for the flock of God. But Himes has already told them, when you go through that house, keep away from the buttery. You'll see. <laughs> That's what was going on in that history. The, and William Miller had this dream about this buttery in 1826. Okay, So he, he had it back, way back here. His whole experience is laid out in that dream. And he had opportunity to see this light, but the dream identifies that he had been given a guide. And it's, it's clear from the history that in 1840, the guide he was given, the counselor, was Himes. And that guide, right as he's going into this house where the buttery is, where the present truth in this history is, the guide says, make sure you don't go into any of the rooms, but stay away from the buttery most of all. So he ends up on the other side of the house at the door of death. But you read that dream in, the, in connection with this history, it's it's very interesting. So in the last paragraph there, they deal with the Albany Conference in this dream as well. The Albany Conference was not very successful in uniting the believers. Some months later, Hale was able to distinguish four major, major classes of Adventists, those who deplored or even condemned their past Advent experience and were strongly opposed to any further time calculations, those who expressed confidence in their former calculations, and felt that the predict predicted events had taken place. Those who were, whose confidence had been shaken by the disappointment so that they were now afflicted with doubt. You ever known people like that? Afflicted with doubt. They can sit through the, the, the presentations of these truths and, the, and they follow the logic. They say they understand the logic, but they still they can't make the hurdle to, to eat it and make it part of their own because they're afflicted with doubt. And four, those who continued setting time, building their calculations upon anything they could find. Of course, the second category there ultimately becomes who we are. So, it's worth reading that history because in this history here, there's a shut door controversy going on. All right, that's, that's 
That's the backdrop of this history. One of the theological question marks that's being hammered out. And what I'm saying is Miller in this history is representing both classes of Adventists. We, we read already that he is typifying those that proclaim the third angel's message because those that proclaim the third angel's message will be operating upon the same rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller. We read that quote. And he's been typified by John. He's been typified by Elijah. And John and Elijah represent the 144,000. So M Miller's representing the Adventists at the end of the world that received the seal of God. But on the other hand, he's representing Adventists at the end of the world that received the mark of the beast. And in his typifying those that received the mark of the beast at the end of the world, there's a controversy over the shut door going on. He's trusting men. He's going to reject the midnight cry. He's going to reject that the seventh month movement was a genuine experience. And then he's going to reject the Sabbath. All right. So notice on page 16, Sister White is going to respond to how she understands the shut door. It is claimed that these expressions prove the shut door doctrine and that this is the reason of their omission in later editions. She's responding to people that said that she once believed incorrectly on the shut door and put it in her writings. And when those writings were afterwards printed, that they removed her erroneous positions out of it. Okay? Which is bogus, but false. That's what she's dealing with here, though. <laughs> But in fact, they teach only that which has been and is still held up as a people, as I shall show. For a time after the disappointment in 1844, I did hold in common with the Advent body that the door of mercy was then forever closed to the world. This position was taken before my first vision was given to me. It was the light given me of God that corrected our error and enabled us to see our true position. I am still a believer in the shut door theory but not in the sense in which we had first employed the term or in which it is employed by my opponents. There was a shut door in Noah's day. There was at that time a withdrawal of the Spirit of God from the sinful race that perished in the waters of the flood. God himself gave the what? The shut door message to Noah. There was a shut door message in Noah's day because there was a shut door in Noah's day. There was a shut door message in the days of Abraham because there was a door that was shut on Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Abraham. John the Baptist was identifying a shut door message because probation was going to shut upon the Jews. William Miller was describing a shut door message, was proclaiming a shut door message because the door into the holy place was going to shut. In fact, the special message that confronts God's people in each of these generations is a shut door message. There's always a shut door message. This is important to see. This is extremely important to see. There's a lot of messages in Adventism today. And there's a lot of quotes where Sister White says there's a special message of truth for every generation. So we can latch onto those and say, well, what I have to teach about God's holy name, Sister White says there's a special message. And this new light on God's holy name, this is the special message. Or what I have to say about keeping the feast days. Sister White says there's going to be a special message. This is the special message. But the reality of it is, is the special message is a message that identifies the shut door. That narrows down what the message can be. All right. There was a shut door in Noah's day. There was a time where it was at that time a withdrawal of the Spirit of God from the sinful race that perished in the waters of the flood. God himself gave the shut door message to Noah. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There was a shut door in the days of Abraham. Mercy ceased to plead with the inhabitants of Sodom. And all but Lot, who with his wife and two daughters, were consumed by the fire sent down from heaven. Was there any angels that came to Lot? What message did they give him? Probation's about to close. You need to get out of town right now. That's a shut door message. All right, there's always a shut door message. There was a shut door in Christ's day. The Son of God declared to the unbelieving Jews of that generation, your house is left unto you desolate. 
Looking down to the stream of time to the last days, the same infinite power proclaimed through John, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, and he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I was shown in vision, and I still believe that there was a shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angel's messages and rejected that light were left in darkness. And those who accepted it and received the Holy Spirit were attended, which attended the proclamations of the message from heaven and who afterwards, now here's Miller, and who afterward renounced their faith and pronounced their experience a delusion, thereby rejected the Spirit of God and it no longer pleaded with them. Those who do not, did not see the light had not the guilt of its rejection. It was only the class who despised the light from heaven that the Spirit of God could not reach. And this class included, as I have stated, and she's going to give two classifications, both those who refused to accept the message when it was presented to them, and also those who, having received it, afterward renounced their faith. These might have a form of godliness and profess to be followers of Christ, but having no living connection with God, they would be taken captive by the delusions of Satan. These two classes are brought to view in the vision. Those who declared the light which they had followed a delusion, and the wicked of the world who, having rejected a light, had, have, had been rejected of God. No reference is made to those who had not seen the light and therefore were not guilty of its rejection. And Sister White teaches this truth often. She talks in early writings, page 259, about this progressive testing process in the time of Christ and those, the Jews that flunked that test. What does she say? They were left in total darkness. In the next paragraph, she goes into the progressing testing process in the Millerite time period and the Millerites that flunked the test. Who were they praying to? Satan. Those are shut door messages. And what shuts the door of probation on that generation is the message, how you, re re you receive the message. If you hear the message of William Miller and say, no way, you just shut the door. If you hear the message of William Miller and accept it, go through the experience of the midnight cry and then afterwards, as he does, decide that the seventh month movement was a delusion, you shut the door. Okay. So there's always a shut door message. The end from the beginning, Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. John saw the things that were and as he wrote them, he was writing the things that would be hereafter because Jesus illustrates the hereafter, the end, from the beginning. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people, Great Controversy 393. Often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter for it has special application to this time and like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. The Millerite history was a perfect fulfillment to the very letter of the parable of the ten virgins. And it's going to be repeated in the history of the 144,000 to the very letter with the nuance of the progressive, progressive testing process and their history is reversed. There are certain things that are reversed. There are certain differences, but there's still uh, the, the identical way marks. So what I'm saying is, after their door closed, the Millerite door closed here, all right? The Millerite door closed here, right? October 22nd, 1844. The Protestants' door closed in 1842, right? In our history, the Millerite door closes at the Sunday Law in the United States. We're the Millerites, right? And the door for the Protestant closes when Michael stands up and human probation closes. It's reversed. So, Though their door closed here, it's prefiguring the closing of this door when we're looking at God's people being judged. They had a shut door controversy that immediately followed after. We have a shut door controversy that precedes our shut door. It's the shut door message. It's a shut door message that comes to Adventism, and Adventism isn't going to want to, want to hear about it. Why do I say there's a shut door message that comes to Adventism? Because there's always a shut door message for every generation. William Miller brought a shut door message. The controversy over it came afterwards. 
There's always a shutdown message. Chiastic structure. Here's another place where Sister White speaks about these, these histories. And this is a uh, great controversy 430, 431. It is those who have by faith followed Jesus in the great work of atonement who receive the benefits of his mediation in their behalf, while those who reject the light which brings to view the work of his ministration are not benefited thereby. Underline that, brothers and sisters. Underline that. The light here that had to be received by the Millerites had to do with Christ's ministration. They had to follow by faith into the most holy place of Jesus Christ and understand what he was doing there. Did they not? That's right. Okay. We have to do the same thing. Right? But Jesus is doing something different now. This, this is the beginning of the judgment. This is the end of the judgment. This is the judgment of the dead. This is the judgment of the living. This is the opening of the books and looking at the records of the dead. This is the blotting out of sins of the living. If the Millerites were required to understand the dispensation, the ministration that Christ was doing here, we're required to understand what Christ is doing here in our time period in the judgment of the living. We have to follow what he's doing in the sanctuary. The Jews who rejected the light given at the first advent of Christ and refused to believe on him as the savior of the world could not receive pardon through him. When Jesus at his intercession entered by his own blood into the heavenly sanctuary to shed a ascension. What did I say? Ascension. <laughs> to shed upon his disciples the blessing of his mediation, the Jews were left in total darkness to continue their useless sacrifice and offerings. The ministration of types and shadows had ceased. That door by which men had formerly found access to God was no longer open. The Jews had refused to seek him in the only way whereby he could be, then be found through the ministration in the sanctuary in heaven. Therefore, therefore they found no communion with, with God. To them, the door was shut. They had no knowledge of Christ as the true sacrifice and the only mediator before God. Hence, they could not receive the benefits of his mediation. You have to understand what he's doing in the sanctuary. The condition of the unbelieving Jews illustrates the condition of the careless and unbelieving among professed Christians who are willingly ignorant of the work of our merciful high priest. Johnson Wagner brought a message of the latter rain. Sister White says so. We all understand it. That message of the latter rain was a shut door message. If it was a latter rain message, the only way you can receive the latter rain is if you sent your sins beforehand to judgment that they can be blotted out and Jesus blots out sins of living people. The door was being shut on, on the, the ministration, because that's what the door represents, of Christ judging the dead. It was moving to the judgment of living in the 1888 time period. But the brethren wouldn't receive it. It was a shut door message. And we have to understand what he's doing in his ministration in order to receive the benefits thereby. That's what he's saying about the Jews. That's what they're illustrating for us. They did not understand the cross and the blood that he took with him into the holy place, the work that he began. In the typical service, when the high priest entered the most holy place, all Israel were required to gather about the sanctuary and in the most solemn manner humble their souls before God that they might receive part, their pardon, the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the congregation. How much more essential in this antitypical day of atonement that we understand the work of our high priest and know what duties are required of us. What's the work of our high priest? In the time period of the latter rain, his work is he's judging living people and he's blotting out their sins. And what is required of you and I in this time period? That we participate in that work of the remo removal of sin, fully understanding that he has identified that this work is underway and we either, either take advantage of it, participate in it, or we're lost. The door's going to shut. We have to understand that. Men cannot with impunity reject the warning which God sends, God in mercy sends them. A message was sent from heaven to, know, to the world in Noah's day, and their salvation depended upon the manner in which they treated that message. Noah's was a shut-door message. Because they rejected the warning, the Spirit of God was withdrawn from the sinful race, and they perished in the waters of the flood. In the time of Abraham, mercy ceased to plead with the guilty inhabitants of Sodom, and all but Lot and his wife and two daughters were consumed by the fire sent down from heaven. So in the days of Christ... 
the Son of God declared to the unbelieving Jews of that generation, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, I know this is similar to what we read, but I want to get this last part in here from the great controversy. Looking down to the last days, the same infinite power declares concerning those who had received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. As they reject the teachings of his word, God withdraws his spirit and leaves them to the deceptions which they love. The Jews were left in perfect darkness. The Millerites were praying to Satan, and we received a strong delusion. Why? Because why? Because the love of the truth. Love the truth, yeah, but let's be more specific to what we're dealing with here. Because we reject the shut door message. There's always a special message to every generation. And when you get very careful about what that special message is, it has to be a message of the shut door. It has to be a shut door message. So what is the shut door message? Daniel 11:41. He shall also enter into the glorious land in many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon door shuts on Adventism. First temple cleansing's finished. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time, Michael sh shall stand up. Door closes on mankind. Second temple cleansing. The shut door message for God's people at the end of the world is the last six verses of Daniel 11. Brothers and sisters, since, since the, you know, 1990s, the mid-1990s, you may not realize it, but there's been a controversy over these verses in Adventism. From the lowest level, from the self-supporting work, to the highest level of the general, con general conference, there is a shut-door controversy going on in Adventism today, just like there was a shut-door controversy going on in the Millerite history. The backdrop for this history here is a shut-door controversy, just as the backdrop in this history was a shut door controversy. The Millerites splintered into various factions and began to argue about what the shut door meant, went, meant and started going their different directions. And in the midst of that controversy, William Miller, first trusting in man, then rejects the seventh month movement, the midnight cry, then rejects the third angel's message. In this history, there's a controversy over the shut door. There's a controversy over the last six verses of Daniel 11. In fact, if you look at Ezekiel 37, brothers and sisters, where Ezekiel prophesies to the bones, there's two prophecies there. There's two prophecies. Let's look at Ezekiel 37. It's not really in the notes, but I want to put it in the record. I like this. Verse 7 of Ezekiel 37, I'm trusting that most of us in this room have looked at Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel is taken to a valley of dead dry bone, which Sister White tells us is the Seventh-day Adventist church. And he's asked the question, can these bones live? And the, he doesn't know. And the Lord tells him the way you're going to bring back to life, you're going to prophesy. So in verse 7, he says, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and uh, I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. What's the breath? Breath is the Spirit of God. There's prophecy that comes to God's people at the end of the world. Sister White says those dead, dry bones are God's people, and that prophecy, what's it do? Causes a shaking. Okay. Causes a controversy. The shut door controversy. This is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And then in the next verse, verse 9, it says, Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds. There is now a second prophecy that comes from the four winds. This is the four winds of Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. And Sister White tells us those winds that are restrained there in, in Revelation 7, the four winds are represented as an angry horse seeking that it might break loose and bring death and destruction in its path. There's a two-step prophetic revelation that takes place in this history. Okay? The first one is the shut door message, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. People don't want to hear probation's about to close. The Sunday law's about to arrive. And if you don't have a character prepared for the seal of God, you're going to receive the mark of the beast. There's all kinds of arguments that fight against that. There have been for... 15 years at least. But on September 11th, 2001, the angry horse 
of Islam was restrained and breath came into God's people. Now life comes into him. So this is where we are in the stream of time. So in the back, in the backdrop of this history that we're living in, there's a controversy of the shut door, just like the Millerite history. And those of us in Adventism that have learned the habit of trusting other men, our question now is, do we really think that the latter rain began to sprinkle on September 11, 2001? Is that, isn't that just a bunch of fanatics that are kind of resting the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy to, to develop some kind of delusion? Because see, if you reach that point, what you're doing is you're re rejecting the manifestation of the power of God that has been prefigured by the midnight cry. And that's just what William Miller did. In the midst of this controversy, trusting in man, he rejected the seventh month movement, which typified the latter reign. This controversy has been going on in Adventism for many years now. And now we're at the testing time of Adventism and the choice for Adventism, particularly, a particularly easy choice for those of us that have been trusting men is, do we accept the revelation of 9-11, that the latter rain is sprinkling, that the judgment of the living is going to begin, or do we reject it as William Miller did? And if we reject it as William Miller did, we find ourselves at the Sunday Law, receiving the mark of the beast and rejecting the third angel's message as William Miller did. Page 18. When did I start? 43, okay. The shut door message. You know, years ago, I worked with Jeff Weir at Hope International. We went to a meeting in Calistoga. And at lunch, I just, I, I had been dealing with this issue. The hey, probation is about to close. Daniel 11 verse 41 is the next thing is going to happen in prophecy. And when the Sunday law arrives in the United States, probation closes on Adventism. So in the back room where we were eating at the Calistoga Fairgrounds, they put a bunch of long tables together. And there was probably 25 people there, people that had been listening. You know, other people went other places to eat. There was, it was a big crowd there. But in that room where we were eating. And everyone at the table got it. It's really not that. It's not that hard to get. Brothers and sisters, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, understand Sabbath Sunday. When the Sunday law arrives, it fulfills Bible prophecy. You either receive the mark of the beast, seal of God. Okay? But Jeff Weir struggled with that. <laughs> I don't really think probation closes at the Sunday law. And he's, he's continued to that this very day. And I'm saying that, not, not worrying about Jeff Weir, but to let you know that there's people that actually make those kind of arguments. And my, my response to that is, when the Sunday law arrives as a Seventh-day Adventist, can I uphold s Sunday for one week? Because if I can uphold it for one week, then, then I can uphold it for one month and still not receive the mark of the beast. And if I can keep Sunday for a month, then I could keep it for a year. And suddenly, the understanding of the third angel is meaningless. It's meaningless. When the Sunday law arrives, we either receive the mark of the beast and seal of God as Seventh-day Adventists. And brothers and sisters, don't doubt that there's a whole group of people in Adventism that are fighting the idea that probation is about to close for Seventh-day Adventists. There's a controversy going on in Adventism, even if you don't hap happen to be aware of it. The time has come. I'm on... Review and Herald, July 13th, 1897. The time has come for the true light to shine amid moral darkness. The third angel's message has been sent forth to the world, warning men against receiving the mark of the beast or of his image in their foreheads or in their hands. To receive this mark, now notice this. As you listen, if you can remember this quote here, as you listen to Dario's presentations tomorrow and Sunday, remember this quote, <laughs> all right? To receive this mark means to come to the same decision as the beast has done and to advocate the same ideas in direct opposition to the word of God. 
Of all who receive this mark, God says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. If the light of truth has been presented to you, has the light of truth on Sabbath and Sunday been presented to all of us in this room? Okay, assuming that we're Seventh-day Adventists, yes, is the answer. Revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing that there's no foundation in the word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep holy the Sabbath which God calls my holy day. You receive the mark of the beast. When does this take place? When you obey the decree that commands you to cease from labor on Sunday and worship God, while you know that there's not a word in the Bible showing Sunday to be other than a common working day, you consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. How simple is that? or people that used to be seven dead, but you're right. And they'll be held accountable. If we receive the mark in our foreheads and our hands, the judgment pronounced against the disobedience must fall upon us, but the seal of God is placed upon those who conscientiously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. Then she references Noah. Dropping down to the time of our visitation. I, too, am trying to build a few foundations for tomorrow's study, as Gary was trying to do. The time of our visitation. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. What's the testing truth for this time? The present truth? The third angel's message, but it's the third angel's message. A lot of people out there claiming to be preaching the third angel's message. And Sister White says men are, that are preaching the third angel's message don't understand what constitutes the third angel's message. What's the third angel's message as we have heard today? It's the message that's based upon the messages of 1843 and 1844. Last, last presentation, very clear. That's the present truth message. There are many who have not heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have not no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. That's our people outside of Adventism, right? His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save while the what? The door is closed to those who would not enter. Adventists have to enter into this, this experience before the Sunday law. Because at the Sunday law, the door closes on them. And Sister White says national apostasy is followed by national ruin. That's the time of God's destructive judgments. After the Sunday law is the time of God's de destructive judgments. And it's a time of mercy for those people that are outside of Adventism that haven't understood the light of Sabbath and Sunday. Brothers and sisters, we're in the time of our visitation right now. This is the time of our visitation. This, this is Christ looking down at Jerusalem, weeping, about Jerusalem if they'd only known he's looking down at us sinners next quote testimonies volume 4 page 191 sinners who have had not, not sinners who have not had the light and privileges of seventh day adventists have that seventh day adventists have enjoyed will in their ignorance be in a more favorable position before God than those who have been unfaithful while in close connection with his work and professing to love and serve him. The tears of Christ upon the mount came from an anguished breaking heart because of his unrequited love and the ingratitude of his chosen people. He had labored untiringly to save them from the fate that they seemed determined to bring upon themselves, but they refused his mercy and knew not the time of their visitation. Their day of privilege was ending, yet they were so blinded by sin that they knew it not. Brothers and sisters, our day of privilege is fast ending. It's ending. That's the shut door message. It's based upon Daniel 11, 40 to 45. And there's a controversy going on about that. And there's people that are developing their confidence in human beings and starting to deny the fact that the latter rain began to sprinkle on September 11, 2001. The desire of age is 235. We've reached the period foretold in these scriptures. The time of the end has come. The visions of the prophets are unsealed, and their solemn warning points us to the Lord coming in glory as near at hand. The Jews misinterpreted and misapplied the word of God, and they knew not the time of their visitation. The reason we don't know is because we've misinterpreted and misapplied the word of God. The years of the ministry of Christ and his apostles, the precious last years of grace to the chosen people, they spent in what? Plotting the destruction of the Lord's messengers. 
Earthly ambitions absorbed them, and the offer of spiritual kingdom came to them in vain. So today, the kingdom of this world absorbs men's thoughts, and they take no, no note of the rapidly fulfilling prophecies and the tokens of the swift coming kingdom of God. Testimonies, volume 6, page 426. Oh, how few know the time of their visitation. How few, even among those who claim to believe present truth, understand the signs of the times or what we are to experience before the end. We are today under divine forbearance, but how long will the angels of God continue to hold the four winds that they shall not blow? Brothers and sisters, almost all, not it, way more than a majority, there, there's got to be a better word than a majority, almost all of Adventism doesn't even know what the four winds represent. But the Lion of the tribe of Judah in the last few years has opened up the understanding of what the four winds represent. I mean, once it's opened up to us, we have no reason to move away from it. Sister White says the four winds are represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and bring destruction and death in its path. But most of Adventism don't understand that those angels holding the four winds represent the restraint that was placed upon Islam on September 11th, 2001. They don't know the time of their visitation. From uh, Great Controversy 317. The watchman upon the walls of Zion should have been the first to catch the, the tidings of the Savior's advent, the first to lift up the voices to proclaim him near, the first to warn the people to prepare for his coming. But they were at ease, dreaming of peace and safety, while the people were asleep in their sins. Jesus saw his church like the barren fig tree. Who, who's, what history is she speaking about here? She's speaking about the, the history leading up to the Millerite movement. Okay, we'll, keep, we'll read on. There was a boastful obs observance of forms and religion. The spirit of true humility, penance, and faith, which alone could render service acceptable to God, was lacking. Instead of the graces of the spirit, there were manifested pride, formalism, vainglory, selfishness, oppression. A backslidden church closed their eyes to the signs of the time. God did not forsake them or suffer his unfaithfulness, his faithfulness to fail, but they departed from him and separated themselves from his love as they refused to comply with the conditions conditions his promises were not fulfilled to them such is the sure result of neglect to appreciate and improve the light and privileges which god bestows unless the church will follow on in the opening providence accepting every ray of light performing every duty which may be revealed religion will inevitably degenerate into the observance of forms and the spirit of vital godliness will disappear disappear this truth has been repeatedly illustrated in the history of the church. God requires of his people works of faith and obedience corresponding to the blessings and privileges bestowed. Obedience requires a sacrifice and involves a cross. And, in this, and this is why so many of the press, professed followers of Christ refused to receive the light from heaven and, like the Jews of old, knew not the time of their visitation. Because of their pride and unbelief, the Lord passed them by and revealed his truth to those who, like the shepherds of Bethlehem and the eastern magi, had given heed to all the light they had received. An upright, honest-hearted farmer who had been led to doubt the divine authority of the scriptures, yet who sincerely desired to know the truth, was the man specially chosen of God to lead out in the proclamation of Christ's second coming. That history wasn't the history of the Jews. That was the history of the times of William Miller, and the times of William Miller are to be repeated to the very letter. That's where we're at today. The Adventist church has every reason to understand the signs of the times. But we don't. Pride, formalism, sin. Yes. Now, tomorrow I have one more thought to put in about Miller. But what I'm saying here about Miller, and we'll, we'll tie this up, Lord willing, tomorrow, is that the history of the Millerites is repeated to the very letter, if we understand the caveat that there's a reversal of some of the issues. And after October 22nd, 1844, in the midst of an argument over the shut door message, over the message that Miller had proclaimed. What did it mean? What did the shut door mean in that message? It's an argument over the shut door message. There's a specific, at least three-step process that William Miller has left recorded for us. First, trusting men. Second, rejecting the midnight cry. And thereafter, 
rejecting the third angel and the Sabbath. This is prefiguring where we are today. The controversy over the shut door. In the midst of that controversy, controversy that's, that's premised on the argument over the last six verses of Daniel 11. Those of us in Adventism that don't know the time of our visitation, that have learned to trust in men, are going to let those men tell them and teach them that the latter rain didn't begin to sprinkle on September 11, 2001. And the next step after that is to reject the third angel's message and receive the mark of the beast. Now, I happen to believe this. If, if I'm incorrect, please correct me. I've had a lot of incorrect understandings in my life. I, and some of them are harder to give up than others, but I like to be corrected. If I'm, if I, if I'm a misunderstanding, this application of prophecy, go ahead and correct me. But from my understanding, there are voices in Adventism, public voices, that are leading people to death. They're specifically teaching them to reject this message, don't get on the platform, and the messengers are required to give a warning message. And a public declaration against the truth demands a public response. So I, I know, I know it causes some people grief when I name names. <laughs> but I believe this message. I believe we're in the time of our visitation. And that God's people either wake up to the fact that they shouldn't be trusting any human beings. And wake up to the fact that they're in the controversy of the shut door and that there's some voices that are specifically attempting to destroy the present truth message of the hour. So occasionally I name names. But I only name names for men that have publicly named me. Okay? So, fair is fair. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we wish to understand that we are in the time of our visitation. And as in each generation of sacred history, when this time arrives, God's people are in a Laodicean condition, playing with idols and darling sins and darkness of every kind. We wish to be awakened and taken out of that condition and put into the condition of a Philadelphian that we might receive the empowerment that comes from the understanding of the message that you open up to our hearts and minds. We wish to give a, a clear and faithful sounding of the trumpet that those that will be warned will be warned and those that will not hear will have their own responsibility to bear upon themselves. We wish to put an urgency into this message as the signs are escalating on every hand. It is clear that you're about to return. And it's clear from the prophecies of your word that when you finally take up the work of finishing up judgment, that the work goes like lightning. It goes as fire in the stubble. The final movements will be rapid ones. We need to understand this urgency and be about our business of, of giving this warning before time runs out. We ask that you would accompany these messages wherever they may go. Empower them to touch hearts, open minds. We thank you for being with us so far throughout this Sabbath. We ask that as we break, you would also give us a refreshing, physical refreshing of sleep. And bring us back here in the morning that we may take this, this study up again in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>